Hello everyone and welcome back to another video. 5 alpha alpha-reductase inhibitors such as finasteride and dutasteride are essential in the treatment of conditions like androgenetic alopecia, also known as male pattern baldness, and benign prosthetic hyperplasia, also known as BPH. This medication functions by inhibiting or blocking the enzyme 5 alpha reductase, which is responsible for the conversion of testosterone into dihydrotestosterone, also referred to as DHT. This hormonal modulation plays a crucial role in both the efficacy of treatment and the potential side effects that may arise from the use of 5 alpha reductase inhibitors. In this video, I'm strictly talking about blood work that one should consider before starting treatment and while on treatment with these medications. And I know there are some people in the audience who probably didn't get blood work before they started using these particular drugs, but nevertheless, it's still important to get blood work while you're on these drugs just to have some sort of reference point for you to look back on because you're going to be using these medications long term so it's better to have some sort of historical line of data that you can refer to for your medical history. It is important for you to talk to your doctor if you should face any issues and although I know there are some adventurous people in my audience, self-medication and even the use of experimental chemicals like RU5841 should not be done at all, but if you go that route, this video should still serve as a good starting point for you to further inquire about your health and the state of your body. So again, don't self-medicate, that's your responsibility, whatever you look into in that particular sort of route of things, but it's always, always best to be under the supervision and care of your doctor. And before we continue, please consider subscribing, as YouTube tells me that only 30% of my viewers are subscribed. That's pretty high when looking at other YouTube channels, so I thank you nevertheless, and also consider becoming a member for as little as $2 a month. Cheaper than your coffee, right? <laughs> so link in the description as well. So anyway, let's get on with this video. So what's the lore behind finasteride and dutasteride? Well, they prevent testosterone from turning into DHT by blocking the class of enzymes that turn testosterone into DHT. This is the 5 alpha reductase enzymes, and they come in three forms known as isoenzymes or isoforms. These are the type 1, type 2, and type 3 isoenzymes of 5 alpha reductase. Finasteride primarily inhibits or blocks the type 2 isoenzyme of 5 alpha reductase, but it's also a weaker type 1 5 alpha reductase enzyme inhibitor. Finasteride, when taken orally at either 1 mg or 5 mg, reduces serum DHT by around 70% and scalp DHT between 30 to 40%. For those of you who don't know, the term serum refers to the concentration that is freely flowing and available in the bloodstream of an individual. DHT is known as a paracrine hormone, which means it's often produced in the areas of specific tissues. For this reason, the concentration of DHT may be 5 to 10 times higher in the skin and or tissues than the bloodstream, or serum. This is why serum DHT levels may not always be a good marker for tissue concentration levels in, say, the scalp. However, serum levels can often be used to make near correlative outcomes on what may be going on in the tissue and signs that the drug is indeed working. Now, there are people that may have higher or lower reductions of serum and tissue levels of DHT while using 1 mg or 5 mg daily oral finasteride, and this could be due to many differences, primarily in the concentration of this enzyme in those parts of the body, but also genetic factors pertaining to metabolism. So how the drug would break down in an individual's body. So when we come up with these ranges of reduction in tissue and serum, that's what tends to be found in the average person. Dutasteride, on the other hand, reduces all three isoforms or isoenzymes of the 5 alpha reductase enzyme. It's also stronger at inhibiting type 2 and type 1 5 alpha reductase enzyme than finasteride. 0.5 mg daily of dutasteride suppresses serum DHT by over 90% and scalp DHT by around 50%. However, going up to 2.5 mg daily of dutasteride suppresses serum DHT by nearly 95% and scalp DHT by around 80%. I made a video talking about the approximate intermediate dose suppression between 0.5 mg up to 2.5 mg dutasteride on scalp DHT, so that link would be in the description below if you want to watch more about that. But coming back to androgenetic alopecia, the lower we can get our scalp DHT, the better efficacy outcomes we can observe over time. 
For some people, they just need to hit a specific threshold at reducing their scalp DHT, so it doesn't need to go all the way up to 80% on a 2.5 mg daily dose of dutasteride. It could be something as simple as the typical 1 mg oral finasteride dose that reduces scalp DHT, again, on average, 30-40%. to 40%. But personally, I find that people who are younger and have more aggressive cases of androgenetic alopecia are better off looking at dutasteride at a 0.5 mg or even 2.5 mg daily dose, as long as they're under a doctor's supervision, of course, and they are aware of the potential side effects on 2.5 mg, right? Because I did this in another video, I already went over this, but 0.5 mg dutasteride has the same side effect profile, if not even less of a rate of side effects than 1 mg or 5 mg finasteride. But when you go up to 2.5 mg dutasteride, you can get a higher rate of sexual side effects, libido, and perhaps other issues like gynecomastia, even though that's significantly low from what we see in the finasteride clinical trial studies and other subsequent studies. So typically in serum, if you're not using finasteride or dutasteride, 10% of your testosterone converts to DHT each day. So while using finasteride, you can expect 9 to 15% higher testosterone levels because you're blocking this conversion of testosterone to DHT by inhibiting or blocking again that 5-alpha reductase type 2 enzyme. Now, in some people, this increase in testosterone can also come with an increase of estrogen because there's this thing called aromatization carried out by the aromatase enzyme that transforms testosterone into estrogens. Now, estrogens are just a class of so-called female hormones. And don't get crazy by the term female hormones. Men and women have varying levels of estrogens and androgens. Androgens, that's the class that testosterone belongs to, the male hormones. Obviously, men have higher androgen levels or male sex hormone levels, and women have higher estrogen levels or female sex hormone levels. So because some of that excess testosterone could turn into estrogen, it would be a good idea to kind of monitor that, right? This is actually why some people face libido issues and mood issues, because that aromatization or the conversion of testosterone to estrogens, if the ratio is too skewed towards there being a little bit too much estrogen than what is normal in that individual, that is, again, what can produce those side effects. So it isn't really DHT that's at play here, it's that aromatization and potential increase of estrogen. So now let's talk about the blood work and some of the bio readings I think people should get before and while on finasteride or dutasteride treatment for androgenetic alopecia and even BPH. So for those of you who haven't taken finasteride yet and you haven't done your blood work, it's important to get this blood work so you can establish a baseline hormonal profile. And for those of you who haven't done blood work but you're on treatment, don't freak out. It's still important for you to get that baseline blood work as early as possible because you may be using these drugs possibly for decades. So it's a great idea to establish a hormonal profile baseline as early as possible in the treatment, if not before you even start treatment. So these key markers to assess include luteinizing hormone or LH and follicle stimulating hormone or FSH. These hormones regulate the production of testosterone and are essential for understanding the hormonal balance within the body. Next, we have sex hormone binding globulin or SHBG. SHBG influences the availability of testosterone for the conversion into DHT, thus affecting the potential impact of 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. So here, this is just my thoughts, but SHBG when testosterone is bound to this, it actually makes it bio-unavailable, meaning it can't readily be used in conversion processes like 5-alpha reductase enzymatic activity. So having low levels of SHBG can consequently, at least in serum, lead to higher levels of free testosterone. And that free testosterone is what we call bioactive. So it can be used in many processes, including the conversion into DHT by 5-alpha reductase. So this is why many times the serum DHT level isn't a perfect indicator of what's going on in the tissue. You just kind of have to trust on faith that it actually is reducing it in the tissue. And to actually know that, it's a bit hard. You'd have to go through scalp biopsies and those are a bit expensive, but don't freak out. 
Typically, it is the case that if you're taking the drug, it should be decreasing scalp DHT levels. But don't get me wrong, I do think in some people this can be a particular issue. It's just that everyone likes to think they're the special case, when in reality, they're not, or they may just have some minor issues with this particular circumstance. But still, get SHBG levels checked as well. Next, you want to get your androgen profile checked. So the androgen profile is what we like to think of the male sex hormones, testosterone, dihydrotestosterone, androstenedione, and maybe DHEA and or DHEAS. Finally, the estrogen profile. Now, those would be the class of female hormones. So it would just say something typically I've seen in some reports, just estrogen or estrogen levels, or sometimes they kind of break it down. They look at the estradiol level. So just get that checked out. Tell your doctor to mark that down in your prescription for your blood work. Now, this next marker I think is very important for males because this marker relates prostate health and finasteride as well as dutasteride treatment. The prostate specific antigen, also known as PSA, a protein produced by the prostate gland, serves as a very important marker for prostate health. The importance of monitoring PSA levels cannot be overstated especially for patients on finasteride or dutasteride. PSA levels can signal the presence of conditions like prostitis, which is an inflammation of the prostate, sometimes caused by bacterial infections or urinary tract infections. It can also give indications of benign prostatic hyperplasia, which has a basis in androgens, specifically DHT, causing for the prostate to grow and inflame. Finally, probably one of the most important and serious conditions of these, prostate cancer. Given that 5-alpha reductase inhibitors are known to decrease PSA levels, understanding baseline values and ongoing changes is vital. A failure to disclose the use of these medications to a physician can obscure early detection efforts as 5-alpha reductase inhibitors like finasteride and dutasteride may mask underlying issues. So if you have a urologist and you got your dutasteride and finasteride from your dermatologist, tell your urologist that, hey, I'm using 5-alpha reductase inhibitors for the treatment of androgenetic alopecia. Tell them, don't try to act weird about this. This is your health we're talking about. Recent studies have provided new insights into the effects of finasteride on prostate health, particularly concerning prostate cancer. While finasteride has been shown to reduce the overall incidence of prostate cancer, concerns have been raised regarding its association with higher grades of cancer detection in prostate cancer cases. Now, before you freak out, this phenomenon is believed to be largely due to detection bias. The medication's effect on reducing the prostate size may enhance the detectability of aggressive cancers during biopsies or screenings leading to a seemingly higher incidence of severe cases. Thus, rather than increasing the risk of high-grade prostate cancers, finasteride may actually improve the identification of aggressive cancers that may otherwise remain hidden. Also, the lowering of the PSA score, like I mentioned earlier, can mask early signs of prostate cancer or potential prostate issues. So again, I keep saying again and again and again, but really I want to reiterate the point, this is why it's important to tell your doctor your urologist, your general practitioner, that you are on these medications so they can do the necessary mathematical adjustment in calculating your near natural PSA score. So even people who didn't get the baseline blood work before starting treatment, still, it is important to have that baseline score established as early as possible in your treatment history. So for instance, it's known that finasteride can reduce PSA scores by 50%. So if a patient presents with a PSA score of 1 nanogram per milliliter, to estimate the natural PSA level, the observed value should be doubled. So 1 nanogram per milliliter times 2 would be 2 nanogram per milliliter. If you present with something like 4 or 5 or 6, that can be, just even on its own, that, that could be a cause for concern. Now, this next section would be the vitamins and the mineral level in your blood. Comprehensive blood work should also include an evaluation of your vitamin and mineral levels, with a particular focus on vitamin D deficiencies. Vitamin D deficiencies are becoming very, very common these days, whether you're somebody with a low melanin content or a high melanin content. Depending on where you live, it can affect 
how much vitamin D you're producing. We know that today with people spending so much time indoors, specifically at work, trust me, I spend a lot of time indoors in the winter and sometimes just in the spring too, believe it or not, just with my job, right? Being an engineer and all. And having lower levels of other vitamins can trigger telogen effluvium. And also it's being found that it can cause cases of alopecia areata for people who have a genetic basis for it. So I'm kind of just saying that really quick because I don't want to make this video longer than it has to be. But just hear me out here. You want to just get your vitamin and mineral levels checked, not even just for hair loss, but just for the purpose of making sure your body is optimal. If not, then you would have to get supplementation and possibly look into eating a proper diet. But today, it's so hard to get a perfect balanced meal with all the nutrients you need just because of how busy we are, just because many of us, we live in, you know, cities and, you know, uh, so-called progressed parts of the world, Western world, first world countries, but we have these issues nevertheless. So that's pretty much it for this video, and I hope you guys can go get that blood work done, maybe with some of the things that I've suggested, but also ultimately referring to your doctor's opinion and advice. I've heard of people getting their prolactin and cortisol levels checked because those two at high enough levels can be concerning for other reasons. Again, I don't want to name those reasons to freak anybody out, but those reasons can also cause hair loss in and of itself and other detrimental health conditions. So just get that blood work done. And if you already are on treatment and you never got baseline blood work of, say, something like your PSA levels, still, nevertheless, the earlier you have that baseline in your treatment history, the better it will be for you because it's likely that you'll be using finasteride or dutasteride long term. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Always remember to tell your doctor what medications you're taking, even the experimental ones. I see you guys in the audience. Yes, I see you. But yeah, if you got this far in the video, comment in the comment section below. Easter Bunny, because at the time of recording this video, it is March 31st, 2024, and it is Easter. So that secret comment would be Easter Bunny. Anyway, thanks for watching this video. Bye, guys.